Uh, well, good morning, church family. Uh, this morning, I just, I just want to pause and reflect on a particular verse that has always been very important to me. Uh, and this verse is 1 Peter 3.15. And it says, But in your hearts set apart Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to anyone who asks you for the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. And so I have for many years always tried to be ready to share God's news. God's good news. Always being prepared to answer a question from others about the, the hope that I have. Always trying to be prepared to present the gospel message to those who desperately need it. Always being prepared to have words of encouragement to those who are hurting or mourning. And always being prepared for a phone call from Pastor Dan a day or two before Sunday morning saying, I'm sick and I need you to preach. Always be prepared. Such a good verse. Such a good reminder. And so many times where I've been thankful for these words that are etched in my heart and on my mind. And so Pastor Dan calls me on Friday and says, Brian, I'm working on my contingency plan. Except it sounds more like, Brian, I'm working on my contingency plan. Like, oh, you don't sound very good, Pastor Dan. It's like, I'm hoping to be better, but I just don't know. And while he's saying this, and while he's speaking these words, again, that verse from 1 Peter rings in my heart, and I'm again reminded how thankful I am for God's promise of that being etched into my mind, of always being prepared. And it's in that moment that I realized I am not prepared. And this cold sweat comes over my body because I usually always have a message prepared in my back pocket in case such a reason. And so this cold sweat starts going over my body and I, I feel distant from God. All right, I'm being a little bit dramatic now with that. But in all reality, I, I did. I remembered at that moment that, yep, my backup sermon, I used that a little while back. And in the busyness of life, I didn't get a chance to be able to sit down and, and prepare another one to be able to have ready. But the exciting thing was in that moment, it wasn't a cold chill that came over my body. And again, this is only because of the grace of God. But I was thankful. I was thankful for an opportunity that I was going to be able to share with you this morning. And obviously I knew that God had something for me to say today. Because while I did not have a full sermon prepared, I knew very quickly what God had been laying on my heart to be able to share with you this morning. And how he was able to take uh, words and, and times that I had been studying before to be able to um, put them together for today's sermon. And while I'm not thankful that Pastor Dan and others, including my son who is at home sick, are fighting various illnesses, I was really thankful for the opportunity to be able to be in front of you today. So the title for today's sermon is called Thankfulness, Our God-Given Superpower. And because this is pinch hitting, there's not going to be anything on the screens. Your uh, stuff that you have in front of you isn't going to help you at all. Um, so I would encourage you to grab a Bible and you can be able to read along with the verses with me this morning as we look at the idea of thankfulness. And I'm particularly excited to be sharing this with you today because this is a topic that has been creating in me a significant heart and mind recalibration. In fact, I was able to share, as I mentioned, some of this at Victory Christian Academy a few weeks back. And we're still kind of in this prime time coming off of the heels of Thanksgiving and, and, and beginning to prepare for the Christmas season. And I really believe that God is wanting to make a dramatic change in our lives, and I pray that he does. And now this is no promise or guarantee of some quick fix and, and a life change type of an activity, but instead an opportunity for God to speak to our hearts 
to allow our minds to focus on heavenly things and to provide opportunity for the Holy Spirit to stir inside of us something new. Now we're into the third week of Advent, celebrating and thinking today of joy. And what God laid on my heart was speaking of thankfulness and gratitude. But you know what? These two words go hand in hand. Thankfulness and joy. And here's just a handful of verses that I want to share with you from the Psalms that talk about thanksgiving and joy in Psalms of praise. But let's pause and pray real quick before we get into God's word this morning. Father, we thank you uh, that you are a God that has given us Um, your word that is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. And Father, may you pierce our hearts and our minds this morning. Father, give me the words to share. Give each of us in this room an opportunity to listen and heed and pray and be encouraged and challenged this morning. In your name, amen. So Psalm 95, 2. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. Psalm 7, 17. I will give thanks to the Lord because of his righteousness. I will sing praises of the name of the Lord Most High. Psalm 104. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. From a heart of thankfulness overflows a spirit of joy and often found in the form of song. Now the one area that I was struggling a little bit as I was prayerfully trying to prepare for this morning was to try and define some basic principles or take-homes to be able to help drive home the idea of thankfulness and what it means to have a thankful heart. And I'm fortunate that I had some time to be able to spend praying and and reading into how some of these amazing truths of how how God works through thankful hearts and overflowing joy. Now, I really don't want people to walk away from today and see this as like a self-help sermon. A self-help to cure anxiety and depression and all of the things of this earth that ail us. And in fact, there was a a quote that I was trying to remember. I I can't exactly remember what it was, but it was something along the lines of self-help can't help the self that's gotten to the point where the help self needs help. Okay? Does that make sense? So this isn't self-help, but it's understanding what God has given to us in forms of grace and promises that can help each and every one of us in our day-to-day lives. And I'm telling you this from a posture of incredible gratitude. As I currently sit under these graces being poured out on me and in my life. And I'm here to tell you a a heart that once was filled with a lot of anxiety and stress and fear. Now feels at peace. And sins struggled with are truly laid at God's altar. And now I'm feeling like I'm truly experiencing true gratitude and living a life that's not my own. I speak to you as one who sought out these truths and these truths have drastically affected the trajectory of my life and my focus on Christ. So my three main points today about a thankful heart are first, our call to be thankful is a duty. We are called to be thankful people. Second, thankfulness leads to an overflowing sense of joy. And third, thankfulness has incredible sin-conquering powers as a true superpower. So first, thankfulness is a duty. And for this section of the sermon, I have to give credit where credit is due. Um, As I was trying to pull this together, John Piper uh, is such a great um, man that I have learned so much from. And and in the heat of the moment, I will tend to default uh, to him. There's lots of great theologians out there. Uh, But John Piper drew me to some verses that really weren't even in my top five verses that I've been working through as I've been digging into the idea of thankfulness. But I see that they're incredibly important. And these verses are from Thessalonians. 2 Thessalonians. If you have your Bibles, you can start working your way there. 
And these verses from 2 Thessalonians are really going to help to put into perspective why Paul's ministry was filled with thanksgiving. In fact, Paul mentions thanks about 50 times in his letters. One of Piper's favorite quotes was a claim by New Testament scholar David Powell, who once wrote, quoting Paul Schubert, the Apostle Paul mentions the subject of thanksgiving more frequently per page than any other Hellenistic author, pagan or Christian. And this helps us to put into perspective when we read 2 Thessalonians 2, 13 through 14. And it says this, But we ought always to give thanks to God for you, brothers beloved by the Lord. Why? Because God chose you as his first fruits to be saved. Through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth. To this he called you through our gospel so that you may obtain the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul says we ought or we should do this, and should implies duty. And Paul is talking about giving thanks and prayer for the people of Thessalonica. And it's not because they were amazing people and they they built grand churches and they were were growing in great numbers and they they were incredibly thankful people. That's not what Paul says. That's not why he's being thankful for the people of Thessalonica. What does he say? But we ought to always give thanks to God for you, brothers. Why? Because God chose you as the first fruits to be saved through sanctification, becoming more and more like Christ in the truth. So he has called you, he called them to our gospel so that you may obtain the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is a God perspective for which Paul is thankful. And so John Piper expresses this as saying, we can experience thankfulness as a burden. And so the duty of thanksgiving is a duty that we can do and not truly experience. I'm going to say it again. Thanksgiving is a duty we can do and not truly experience. Here's a quote from Piper. If you experience gratitude as a burden, you don't know gratitude. Because true gratitude is not an exertion of the will. It is an overflow of a sense of being treated better than you deserve. And Piper gives this analogy. A kid who gets black socks for Christmas from his grandmother when he really wanted a fire truck. And he's sitting there opening the presents and his mom looks over and sees his eyes on on her son's face and knows what he's thinking. And being a good mom, right away she says, son, you make sure you say thank you to your grandmother for those socks. And the little boy is holding those black socks and he looks over at his grandmother and he says, thank you, grandmother, for my socks. That boy was not experiencing gratitude at that moment. Gratitude was a burden. And it feels like hypocrisy for one reason. The emotion was not there. Now, if he had opened a fire truck right away, His response would have been, oh boy, thank you, Grandma. That's exactly what I wanted. And that would have been gratitude, not out of burden, but would have been true gratitude. Maybe some of you feel like you're fairly thankful people, but you're still overwhelmed with bitterness or anger or anxiety. Then I'm here to say you may be experiencing thankfulness, but without actually experiencing it. You're like the kids where mom or dad says, say thank you, because it's the right thing to do, or it's culturally right to do that. And it's done out of obligation. But when we truly experience thankful hearts, it leads to my second point. Thankfulness leads to an overflowing sense of joy. Now for this section, I really want to differentiate joy in the sense of self-gratification and not focus on Self-gratification. We're thinking big picture joy. Joy expressed to God for who he is and how he chooses to look at us as sons and daughters adopted to himself. 
I'm not talking about the joy of getting that promotion at work, but instead I want to focus on a much bigger, more awe-inspiring sense of joy. Now I'm going to talk about joy in a more practical sense in our third section. But if we don't frame it in the right framework, when we talk about being thankful and the benefits and the power that it has in our lives, we can very easily fall into a ditch of legalism. I'm going to be thankful... Because I know if I am, I'm going to be less anxious. I'm going to be thankful because if I am, I'm going to be better at managing my anger. And I don't want us to fall into that ditch. But I want us to maintain a heavenly perspective with our joy. And so we go back to that verse that we talked about with Paul. Paul says we ought to give thanks. And the reason is, is because again of what God had done in the lives of the Thessalonians. So Paul was looking at the people of Thessalonians and he was thankful for how God was at work. And and as pastors, we get to sit back and look at the congregation and be able to see individuals growing and to be able to see people who are called by Christ to be adopted as sons and daughters. We get to celebrate baptisms and seeing people publicly proclaim the inner change that has occurred in their heart. We get to see you growing and serving in the Lord as you continue on this process of becoming more and more like Christ. And we're able to see the gospel transforming lives. And we shouldn't be able to hold back inside that that desire to say, thank you, God. Thank you for how you are at work in your people. This past week, God put this concept into practice Uh, in my life, and in probably many of your lives as well. This past week when I got a text message about one of my best friends being in cardiac arrest down in Minneapolis and being rushed to a hospital and not knowing anything more, my immediate emotions of fear, which were very real and very raw, were quickly turned to thankfulness. Thankful for the fact that this occurred in Minneapolis, close to amazing medical facilities and not in the wilderness of Alaska where he was a month before. Thankful that he was with his wife who was able to recognize that something was going on and to to, to call for help. Thankful that paramedics were able to arrive quickly. Thankful that doctors had procedures and the insights to be able to stabilize and help him. And so my heart turned to expectant prayers and and after hearing that he was stable and being treated and and I was able to speak to him on the phone and, and pray with him, God was just ripping at my heart, reminding me to be thankful because none of us are guaranteed tomorrow. And as I prayed over it more, I also realize that my heart of gratitude shouldn't change even if the situation was different. But the question is, is how do we exist in a place of gratitude when we're in the throes of brokenness? Because Paul tells us that this grateful heart is not just reserved for when God shows us favor. 1 Thessalonians 5.18 says, Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Don't just give thanks when God looks favorably upon you. Don't just give thanks when when the world seems good and life is, is comfortable. But God says, give thanks in all circumstances. And this is where Paul takes time to reflect on all the areas that he had seen God at work. So don't don't waste another day without reflecting on God's greatness, on God's provision in your life. Because having a heart focused on these will help us to endure the times of difficulty. Don't reserve thinking about why you're thankful for one holiday a year. Make this a daily routine in all things. Now this is where uh, 
that brings us to my third section. And we're going to go from a macro, big, to a micro, small, and look a little bit more at the day-to-day -day power of a thankful heart by looking at my third point, which is thankfulness has incredible sin-conquering powers. And I would call it a true superpower. And we had a lot more kids during the first one. Um, and they relate to the superpowers right away, right? We're going to Marvel or Superman. And while we're not going to leave today with x-ray vision, we're not going to be able to fly out of the sanctuary, hopefully you can learn about something really incredible that God has given to each and every one of us, a superpower that he desires us to use daily in our lives. Now, I do want to be careful not to confuse that Christ is the ultimate conqueror of sin. He died and paid for our sins once and for all. And I also don't want to diminish the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. The Holy Spirit is alive and at work and is incredibly powerful in our lives. But just to simply say that I believe the idea of thankfulness and gratitude is a powerful tool that God has given us to fight against sin in this broken world until the day that we are called home to be with him. I want to share a quote from a pastor that I had read recently, um, a couple months back, uh, as this has been really reshaping in my life. Thanksgiving is not merely a nice character trait. It is a sin-conquering force. Gratitude is both a vital indicator of our soul's health and a powerful defender of our soul's happiness, which means we should intentionally cultivate the healthy habit of thanksgiving. And like I mentioned, uh, these truths have been incredibly radical in my life. And as I'm sitting under these graces with a renewed idea of what it means to have gratitude and to be able to place things for God and to be in a place where I can be at peace with things, I'm here to tell you that as someone who has sought these truths, that these truths have been effective and powerful. And I want us to look at Scripture to see how God's Word emphasizes these truths. So the more I began looking into scripture and other theologians and the research of this idea of a, the power of a grateful heart, I heard it again and again, this process of gratitude and thankfulness. And scientifically, when we express gratitude, it causes a synchronized activation in multiple areas of our brains. And it lights up parts of our brain's reward pathways. And the hypothalamus, which is like the hard drive of our brain, in short, gratitude can boost the neurotransmitter serotonin. And serotonin is, is a neurotransmitter that's primarily produced in your gut. Thus, have many of you heard the word, listen to your gut? Because your guts actually produce a, a chemical called serotonin that helps us to make wise choices, to help us to differentiate and work through stressful times and have clarity. Listen to your gut. And when we experience gratitude, our body naturally starts producing serotonin. It also starts um, to activate the brain stem, which is producing dopamine. And dopamine is the, the brain's happy drug. Isn't that cool when science comes in line with scriptural truths? God loves science. God created science. And he loves when we discover how amazing our bodies are. And it's so cool to see these discoveries and see that the Bible is 100% in line in them. And isn't it amazing that even before we were able to do brain scans and figure out all this stuff of how our brain works, God knew this. And the writers of the Bible wrote about it. Thankfulness, thankful heart. 
You can conquer things with thankfulness in your mind and in your heart. So often today, people look at Christians as people who lack intelligence and use religion as a crutch, your self-help crutch. They mock the Bible without even researching or reading what it is. Not even realizing how it's the most accurately preserved piece of literary work in history. There's no other documents that even come close. And when the Bible talks about thankfulness and thanksgiving and the power that it has, it's important for us to heed that. And I want to read just a few verses about the power of thankfulness in our lives. Colossians 3, 5-17 through 17. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts to which indeed you were called in one body and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your heart to God. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. What about anxiety? Can thanksgiving help with anxiety? Philippians 4, 6, probably many of you have this memorized. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. What about sexual immorality, impurity, coveting, foul language, Ephesians 5, 3 through 4. Sexual immorality and impurity or covetousness must not even be named among you as is proper among the saints. Let there be no filthiness or foolish talk or crude joking, which are out of place, but instead let there be thanksgiving. It doesn't say, let instead there be a strong personal endeavor to push through these things. It doesn't say, in place, have good comrades to come alongside of you and help you through. It says simply, instead, let there be thanksgiving. There is power in a thankful heart and in a thankful mind. Did you know that Joseph was able to overcome the temptation of Potiphar's wife because he had a thankful heart? When he's in the depths of that temptation with Potiphar's wife, he recounted how God had blessed him. Potiphar had given him his home and authority above none else in his home. But he knew the one thing that he couldn't have was Potiphar's wife. And so he focused on how God or how Potiphar's provisions for him was a, was a blessing from God. And by focusing and being thankful, was able to resist temptation. God created us in such a way that when your heart and mind are filled with thankfulness, there is no room for self-gratification, for envy, for lust, or a covetousness spirit, covetous spirit, or a desire for what someone else has. And that is why I'm calling it a superpower. Because when you look at Webster's Dictionary, one of the definitions of superpower is it's a power that's superior to others. And I think the Bible is pretty clear here that the power of thanksgiving can overcome so many of these sins. I want each and every one of us to focus on using these great super, or this great superpower. If you're struggling with wanting with what others have, stop and write down, think about, pray about how God has provided for you in your life. If you're struggling with some self-indulgent indulgent sin that you just can't seem to break, I want to challenge you in those moments, stop and focus on being thankful. Immediately think about the areas in your life of which God has provided favor for you. Think about the attributes of God and his desires for your life based on the truths of his word. Focus on God and give thanks. When I was talking to the kids at VCA a couple weeks back, I wanted to give them a superpower sign that they could use to help remind each other about being thankful. And you know, Batman has his bat signal. Okay, the Green Lantern has his ring. The Guardians of the Galaxy, they have communication stars that they use. And I wanted to give them a sign that they could use to show each other, to remind each other the idea of being thankful. And it's, in sign language, to say thank you is, is to do this gesture at someone. Thank you. And thankfulness is two out. It's an emphasis on the thanks. Thankful. I am thankful. 
And it was interesting, on Friday night, Jen and I attended our boys' Christmas program at Victory Christian Academy. And it was an encouraging night of singing and music and, and skits and bell choirs. But the part that I was most moved on was when the third grade class came up and signed the song Silent Night. And watching those kids express with their bodies while the words were being played moved in me. And I know it's hard to believe, but I began to tear up. I don't know why, but God impressed upon me. And, and as I was thinking about this idea of thankfulness, look at the natural posture that it does for our hands. Hands open, saying, God, I give you my spirit and my life, and receiving God's grace, thank you. Hands open is another way that we can simply show gratitude. Lifting our hands, and if you read the Psalms, it's in there a lot. Raising your hands to the heavens. And singing a hallelujah, which is Hebrew for praise the Lord. Hallelujah. And I'm going to be honest, growing up in this church, I didn't see a lot of hand raising. And this is a whole other sermon topic, and I don't want us to get sidetracked. Um, and I don't want you to feel like you, you're an under an obligation to have to do certain gestures. I don't want you to feel like, well, if I don't raise my hands, I'm doing something wrong. Because posturing is difficult. But when we read about posturing, it talks a lot in the Psalms about doing it. And so we're going to close with a video that's going to play. And I just want you to, to listen and watch the video. And then we're going to go into our final worship song. As we worship, focus on God. And what he has done for you in your life. Saving you, calling you, and providing for you as his sons and daughters. May we be a church of thanksgiving.